Hey, South Hills, little did you know that we actually have a staff from all of our campuses that come together to make sure that we are aligned, we are unified, that we're moving in the same direction because the way South Hills does church, we want to make sure that we're doing it in an effective way at all of our campuses that's going to be insightful and relational and it's going to help you to connect to the presence of God and draw closer to God every single day. And the beauty about our staff is that they lead by example by making sure that their hearts are surrendered to God. And I just want to let you in behind the scenes so you can see the time and energy that our staff steps into serving you. So today before you leave, find a staff member at whatever campus you're at and just thank them. Thank them for all the work and all the hours and all the sacrifice that they put in to make sure that when you come to church, you're getting an amazing experience to follow God with all of your heart. Welcome to South Hills Manhattan Beach. How are you? That is awesome. That, you know what, just right now, you guys, that, that just really touched my heart. Because the 9 a.m. service, there was one person that went, woo. And he was 12. And so I was like, of course he's going to be wooing right now. He's having fun. Everybody else is like, hey, bro, it's 9 a.m. Could you just... Keep the, keep the chill factor on, okay? It is the week after Easter. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm the campus pastor here. Uh, if I have not had the opportunity of meeting you, please. Oh, come on. Stop. Uh, but if I haven't had the opportunity of meeting you, please uh, introduce yourself after service. Come say hi. I would love to get the chance to meet you, get to know you a little bit. Um, we uh, consider ourselves a family here. And so once you're here, you're stuck. I mean, you know, it's like that family member that you're like, I really don't want to show up, but I'll be there, okay? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we love having every one of you here. Uh, if you're our guest, like Jules said, uh, we would love to get to know you a little bit more. Please fill that out and drop it off in uh, one, of the, one of the buckets. We have a, a box over here and a couple on those tables back there for offerings as well. But um, anyhow, we are closing out this series worth repeating about the final words of Jesus. The, the last few weeks we walked through the final words that he said on the cross. And today we're going to look at the statement that he said to the disciples before he ascended back up to heaven. And in Matthew 28 he says, go and make disciples. In Mark it says, preach the gospel. Either way, if you're really bringing the good news, you're going to absolutely end up with disciples that are coming on board to essentially keep reproducing more disciples. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that, that word disciples is real common for us. Like, you know, it's like a, that's just a biblical term, right? I mean, we're just talking about just the disciples, right? Not just being a disciple. But I'd love to dig into that and see what that really means for us here. I remember when I was 13, 14, 15, I was in a youth group. And uh, actually the youth group was uh, our founding pastor here, Chris, who founded South Hills uh, in Corona in 1998. Um, before that, he was actually uh, the youth pastor on staff at a church that I was at. My dad was uh, one of the pastors on staff there. So I've known Chris and, uh, and uh, the, his ministry since I was in youth. He was my very first youth pastor and uh, we had a church, I, th I think the church was four or five hundred people. It wasn't very big. Well, I mean, not tiny, but just a, you know, a regular neighborhood church and might be decently full, two services. Uh, but the youth group had 500 kids. So you, you knew that something was happening there. He was just the type of guy that was just so on fire to tell people about Jesus that he just couldn't stop. He was at every school event, everything that you could do. And he had a team with him always showing up for the kids at everything that they were doing. And there was 500 young people that would come. They ended up leasing a building across town to make a youth center out of. And uh, that was my experience in youth. Now here's, here's the funny thing. 
is that out of 500 kids, and you can imagine, not all of them are church kids, especially if our church was only 400 and some, 500. Uh, you can imagine there are invites from other people. So the, randomly, there would be like stuff happening outside. Kids would get into trouble, little altercations, random stuff. But I'll tell you this. As much as there was some of those things that you are just inevitable when you get a bunch of kids around each other and they start doing things, you, I mean, you tell them not to climb the tree. And before you know it, I'm out there and they're at the top of the tree. And I'm like, guys, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Can you please come back down? <laughs> but in, in all of it, I look at my time back in youth and in the student ministries. And I know that there's a lot of great leaders and those who are still discipling in the church today that came out of that youth, youth group. I know a good handful of churches in the Southern California area and even beyond in different states around this country whose leadership were once kids in that youth group. I know half a dozen in there that are pastoring today, if not more. And I know plenty more than that that are involved in church leadership, that are helping disciple, coach, lead, do anything they can within the church and within the body of Christ. So I would say that even though it was just a bunch of kids there and it's a full, a full house and you don't know what's really happening, there was discipleship happening. Kids were being discipled. And we see the fruits of it, the results of it still today. Today is uh, kind of our student takeover day. We like to get the students involved in our service as much as possible. And... Um, I believe it's so important, and I've said this before, to pour into our next generation. I think if anything, they're the ones that need to be discipled most. If anything, we need to make sure that we pour into the next generation as much as we can. Because like we all know, they're going to be the next ones taking control of a lot of things. They're going to be the next ones leading our churches, leading our councils, our boards, and the things around us. So we've got to learn how to disciple them here and now, today. We're going to take a good look at what Jesus meant when he said to go and make disciples. But before we do, would you just bow your heads with me for just a moment. Lord, I pray that here and now, in this moment, whoever's watching online, whoever's outside on the patio, whoever's here inside this room with us, I pray, God, that you would speak to each one of us in a very personal way, Lord. Our walk with you is personal. Our relationship with you is personal, not one the same. Each and every one of us are different, God. We are uniquely created by you, and we have a relationship with you that's individual, that comes personal to each and every one of us, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would speak to us exactly where we are. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord. Change us, challenge us, but most of all, encourage us, God. I pray that everybody in this room is blessed by you, but most of all that you're blessed by all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 28. And um, this, is where, uh, this is where Matthew's walking through kind of the last bit of Jesus here on earth. This is after he rose up from the grave. We talked about the resurrection. Last week was Easter. It represents the day that Jesus came out of the grave and he was alive again. That when you thought that he was crucified and dead, he came out of the grave like he said he was going to. And he was alive. And we know that because of all the accounts that we read about in the Bible, over 500 saw him after he rose from the grave. Many, many accounts of Jesus showing up to not only the disciples, but... Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and other apostles and disciples along the way. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 says this. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated to them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And in Mark chapter 16, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Both Matthew and Mark have an account of Jesus speaking to the disciples in those last moments right before he ascended back to heaven. And they heard it a little bit different, a little bit different of a perspective. Mark says, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Matthew says, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Do we know exactly which one he said, how he said it per se? Do we know what the Hebrew words are there? Or most likely Aramaic in that sense right there. Like all we know is he said, go and make disciples, preach the gospel, bring the good news. Here's a question I have for us. If you had a product that you thought every household should have, maybe a technique for something that was regularly very difficult or extremely hard to handle, but with your technique it makes it almost effortless. If you had a life hack, a quick fix, or even a problem-solving program What's the first thing you do? What has our world taught us to do when you have something that people need? Man, you got to figure out how to market that puppy, don't you? That's the natural way to think. You got something good. You got to share that thing, man. Everybody's got to have it. First, you're talking to your friends. You're like, I had an idea. And you start sharing this idea. And like, That's a good one, man. You should do something with that. You know, you should take that somewhere. Before you know it, you're like, man, do I really need to start another business? But that's what we're taught to think is that if you got something good, you better market it. You better promote it. You better share it. You better figure out how to capitalize on it. Some of us would say, well, man, I, I'm, not, I'm not a salesman. I'm more of an introvert. I know where you're getting to of this. Like, I, I'm not a preacher. You want me to go and preach the gospel, but... I, I, I'm just not a preacher type of person until something affects our kids or hits a little too close to home or maybe until we figure out that we have something very special that people need to know about. I love the phrase that says, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. I'm sure most of us have heard that before. And that phrase is attributed to St. Francis. But here's the funny thing. St. Francis never actually said it. In fact, there's no proof of where it actually originated from, which is pretty funny to me. Because somebody actually didn't say something about not saying something. <laughs> Anybody get that one? Like how that happened? St. Francis didn't actually say, go preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. But yet it's attributed to St. Francis. So maybe someone saw the life that St. Francis lived and maybe it was enough to be of impact. And maybe it just came across. The funny thing is, is to this day, we still use that phrase. We still think of it that way. Plenty of times. Most of us who have been in church for a good amount of time would say, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, we know. You preach the gospel by your actions. You make disciples by being a disciple. You go share the word by just being the word. Be the one who represents what Jesus taught and how Jesus said to live Mark says to go and preach the gospel. Matthew says to go and make disciples. Here's the thing. The definition of a disciple is a follower or student of a teacher, leader, or philosopher. I don't think that you can make disciples without preaching of the good news. Now, some of us think preaching is standing up on a stage and sharing a message. But really, in the context of what Jesus was talking about, 
He was saying, go share it. Go say it to everyone you can. Go tell them. Tell them the good news. You might say, well, I, I, what, what am I, like, what does that mean, man? Like everybody I come across, you know, do you know Jesus? Listen, I, I've never been that guy. I, I think there's some in this room that are extremely gifted in that area, that they can pop a conversation about Jesus with anybody. And that's, again, they've got a gift. They can just walk up and talk, be talking to somebody and say, you know, you know Jesus loves you. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know why, but I've never been that type of guy. I'm, I'm always the type of, is like, let me just show by my actions. Let me be extremely kind. Let me remember a name. Let me look for a tag and make sure to say it and say, hey, have a great day. I hope you have a good day. Hope everything's all right. How's your day going? Just stuff like that. The good news is the fruit of the Spirit. If we don't reflect the fruit of the Spirit, if we don't don't have any of that going on, then how good really is it? Is the good news that just that Jesus died and rose again and he's available to you. Well, if he's available to you, but the only Jesus that you represent is the angry Jesus that says, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing this, you should change this, and you need to change that, then you can know Jesus. That seems like it's uh, straying from the good news. When we think of a definition of a disciple, a follower, a student, of a teacher, leader, a philosopher, where do you think we are learning the most from in our world today? What is our biggest source of discipleship in our world today? What do you think our kids are learning most from today? Here's a better question. Who out there has the most followers? (laughs) Who's creating the most disciples in this world today? I feel like that changes a lot. Because then it's like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Now we're talking about social media, right? And celebrities, influencers, all that kind of stuff. Well, if we get there, I'd say TikTok is doing the best job at discipleship right now. They're the ones making the most waves. They're the ones who the kids are sneaking off trying to watch. They're just scrolling through things, challenges and all these things that they're being challenged to do. And people are saying you should do this. Here's a new trend. Everybody's on board. Many are on board. Here's a little perspective. The followers, the top five Instagram accounts. Our number one is Instagram itself. So they have almost 500 million following them, and they're just promoting the platform. Cristiano Ronaldo, number two with 410 million. He's he's a soccer player. Here in the States, I mean, probably most of us have heard his name, but here in the States, we're like, football, man. I'm, you know, I watch the NFL. I'm a Peyton Manning guy, you know. I mean, I, 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 that's, that's, soccer is not football, but around the rest of the world, soccer is pretty popular if you don't know that. Soccer is uh, the most popular sport in the world. And it goes to show you by Cristiano Ronaldo has 410 million and just a couple down from him, Lionel Messi. He's got 310 million. The rest of them, in the top Instagram accounts are Kylie Jenner, The Rock, Selena Gomez, Ariana Grande, Kim Kardashian, Beyonce, and another Kardashian. And I'd say most of them are doing a pretty good job at creating disciples, creating followers of what they do. Trends. This is what you should do in life. And some of it is pointed towards the positive. Set goals. Do your best. You can accomplish anything. But I got to tell you, Out of all of those accounts, very rarely will you ever see anything pointed towards Jesus. Very rarely are any of them using their platform to disciple for the kingdom. They're creating little disciples, that's for sure, but not for the kingdom. How about five of the top YouTube accounts are kid channels? And I don't think I'm the only parent that sees the effects of what my kids watch. None of those five YouTube channels are channels about Jesus. They're not about the kingdom of God. They're not about making disciples for Christ. But yet they're teaching our kids a lot. You say, wait, I'm way too old for social media and YouTube stuff. I'm I'm not, I don't, I don't really buy into that stuff. So how does this relate to me? Well, then maybe we'll just talk about the news then. 
the news that whether we watch it on TV, whether we read articles, whether we get emails sent to us, whether we jump on a video or something, we have some way of being taught, trained, and led. Most of us, if we're smart, we choose to read and watch and be led by things that feed our spirit, that feed us in a good way. We look for things that stand for truth. But when we're not, we can really see the fact that the world out there is doing a mighty fine job of making disciples. There's a whole lot of discipleship going on out there. In my personal opinion, I feel like the church is just a little bit behind in that. I think we could do a better job. We're not on the list. <laughs> we were joking about it outside. But somebody said, how can we get like, uh, Jesus is already taken, right? There's, there's no Jesus Instagram out there. Well, yeah, there is. And I think it's kind of a joke. But like <laughs> we were talking about, it, we thought, what if there was actually an account where we said, hey, come on, let's do something about this. And although that might be far-fetched, what can we do about it as the church? How can we be more effective in making disciples? I believe that there's a good reason why we, we don't have that market cornered. I believe there's a good reason why we're kind of in our shells and we say, well, I, I, I'm not a preacher. I'm not going to, I don't know how to go and make disciples. It's a fear. There's a fear in there. How do I say it? What do I say? What do I do? How am I going to share with somebody? If I share with somebody, they're going to go, oh, you're a Christian. I don't like Christians. Maybe because somebody else hasn't represented Christ in a good way. So we have this fear inside that's kind of like, ah, I guess if the right moment comes up, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. But I believe that fear comes from unbelief. See, we believe in Jesus. We even believe in what he did. We just don't believe in what he said. We don't believe in what he says to us, about us, that he can do through us, within us. Can I share something with you today that has been on my heart lately? I'm just going to call it the Jesus fact. Because something's become very real to me. And that's half the battle is taken care of. If we would actually realize that what we believe in with Jesus conquers a whole lot more than we think, then we can move into the side of believing everything that he said. That these things that I have done, you shall do greater. But when we, when we think of Jesus, we know that the man Jesus is a fact, right? We know that the crucifixion is a fact, right? We even know that there is way too many accounts of the miracles and the things that he did to just dismiss them and say, well, we're not really sure if those things happened. Well, they happened from different people's accounts, written separately, still the same miracles, a little bit different perspective, but still the same things. We have an account for everything that Jesus did. So in all reality, who Jesus was, what he did, all of his actions, they're facts. Half the battle's done. Our God, the creator of all things, He's a fact. Jesus was a man who was crucified. Over 500 saw him after he was crucified. Rose from the dead. Way too many accounts, way too many written accounts to just dismiss it and say, well, it's kind of like our faith. No, it's not. Jesus is a fact. Our faith isn't in what Jesus did. Those are facts. Our faith is in what he said. That's where our unbelief rises up. Here's what Jesus said in a nutshell. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. That means he's the only way. And he proved it by being the only one willing to die to show it. To sacrifice his life to show how important it was that he is the only way. He said to love others, specifically our enemies, and that forgiveness is available to all those who also forgive. Remember that. Salvation is free. Forgiveness is free. But 
you have to also forgive to receive that forgiveness. You can't walk in unforgiveness and expect God to just wipe away everything in our lives. He said, go share all that I have taught you. And remember, all the wonders you saw me perform or that you heard about, you shall do greater. See, if you ask any of us in this room why we're here, and if anybody said, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus, you wouldn't be here in this room if you didn't believe in Jesus. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think that Jesus was real. And that at least there's truth in this book. You're not here because you think it's a big hoax, a big story, and it's just all, oh, that's a nice story. You're here because you believe it's real. The next step is to believe what he says, to believe what Jesus said. See, Jesus lived what he said, and he said what he lived. There was no separation between the two. He never said anything that wasn't truth. He lived a sinless life, which means that everything that came out of his mouth was absolute truth. So if we believe he did what he did, then we have to believe in what he said. And that changes everything. Because that means that everything that Jesus had within him is available to you and I. That means that when we talk about making disciples or preaching the gospel, you don't need any special skills. You don't have to be specially gifted or specially talented. You have everything it takes to go and make disciples, to represent Jesus and to see the change in those around you. It doesn't mean that we don't endure trials and tests and struggles and stress, but it means we do it for the joy set before us with peace that passes all comprehension and with a hope for eternity. If I'm going to face the giant that is this world today, I want to know that I have the hand of God on my side. I want to know that I have what Jesus had available to me at all times. If we believe in him, then we have to believe in what he says. And we have to believe that we have the greatest gift to share and to promote. That we actually do have something that every household needs. We have something that every person that you come in contact, nobody, nobody is meant to live this life without a relationship with Jesus. God created each and every one of us and his desire is to unite with him to reunite with him. He created you, and he's asking for the love back. He's asking for the return of relationship. I believe as the body of Christ, we should be leading the charge in making disciples by sharing the good news that we have, that is the gospel, with words when necessary. I, I would like us to start a mission. I know that we've all of us have probably participated in some random act of kindness at times. You thought, oh, I'll pay for the person behind me in line, or I'll do this for somebody, or hey, let me lend you a hand, or whatever it might be. But what if we started thinking of just our life and what we do and how we go about our days, and we put at the forefront of those things acts of Christ? What does that look like to you? If someone were to say, hey, do you think that you could just maybe do some acts of Christ out there? Maybe do some acts like he did? I mean, his loving kindness led to repentance. Most of the time, on the spot, immediately. Did he go around and heal and perform miracles? Yes, he did. He said that that's available to us. When we pray, when you pray for somebody that's going through it, are you expecting the prayer to be answered? Or are you just praying because you just think, well, I guess I'll give it a shot? Either way, something in you believes that it's possible. So when we pray, that little bit of faith starts to rise up. And our job is to make that faith 
overtake the unbelief and believe that everything that God says, everything that Jesus said, we're capable of carrying out. What kind of acts? Supernatural ones, the kindness that led people to immediate repentance, the peace that calmed the seas, those kind of acts, the man who sacrificed everything just so we could do life with him. Those kind of acts. Yes, anything that you picture Jesus doing, we're called to do the same, other than none of us have to go die on a cross. We don't have to sacrifice our life in that way because Jesus did that for us. Sometimes it's just showing the gentleness and self-control and love that just makes others' lives matter a little bit more. When Jesus said, go and make disciples, he was talking to the ones who believed in both what he did and what he said, probably because they saw it firsthand. Well, my question would be, what has God done for you? What prayers has he answered? When has he come through in a time of trouble or in a time of where you needed something? You just needed God to show up. Maybe it was a miracle. Maybe it was just a simple answered prayer. What has God done for you? And if you're sitting here this morning and you say, ah, man, I, I don't know. I, I haven't really walked walked with God. I, I don't know about this whole doing life with him. I haven't really experienced much with God. Then what is it right now that you need God to do? Why are you here this morning? Why are you here? Is it just to maybe get a little bit of community with some good people? Maybe some like-mindedness? Is it just to get it out of the way? And I better go to church. I better show up and do my part. Or is it because you truly do believe that God does have something for you? That he can answer your prayers? That he can meet you in the situation you're in right now? That no matter how hard or difficult the trial, the struggle is, that he can give joy in the middle of it? That he can give peace in the middle of it? Because if we believe in who he was and what he did, then we have to believe in what he said. And if he says that I can take joy in my trials and I can represent that to those around me, then I believe it. If he says that I can have peace beyond all comprehension, beyond understanding, no matter what's happening in my life, no matter what's happening with my kids, my situation, whether it's financial, physical, spiritual, no matter what it is, if he says that he has a peace available to me, then I want that peace and I want to believe that. When Jesus said to go and make disciples, he was just saying, go and reproduce me. Go and reproduce what I have shown you and what I have told you. And that's what I would like to do. What has God done for you? What do you need him to do? Let's take what he does in us and share it by at least walking in gratitude and reflecting it. I'm pretty sure it will lead us to acts of Christ. Think about that this week as you go. Think about what actions, what things can you do that would represent Christ, no matter where you are. For many of us, it'll start in the home. It's got to start in our relationships in our home. For others, it's going to be in the workplace because you're there most of the time. And you're going to have to think hard. You're going to have to hold back sometimes because things can be frustrating. And life can get to you. But how can we reflect Christ and act like him? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would show us, show us your ways more and more and more as we walk with you, God, as we get closer to you. As many of us in this room desire a deeper relationship with you, some of us in this room, God, we, we don't fully know what that means and it's a new experience for us, and maybe, maybe, this is, maybe this is your first time in a church experience. Maybe this is your first week in church, and you're like, whoa, man, this is heavy. I got to go and make disciples. Well, you know what the first step is? For you to become a disciple. So if you're in this room this morning, and you say, you know, I would love to affect the world around me 
in a positive way. I would love to be a good influence on the people in my life. And I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If that's you this morning, if you believe in the man that Jesus was and what he did, and you say, I want to know more about what he said, I want to believe in what he said, and I want it to act out in my life. If that's you this morning, whether it's your first time accepting Jesus or maybe it's been a long time since you've walked with the Lord, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just look up and make eye contact with me if you'd like to start your journey with Christ? Look up and make eye contact with me so I can be praying with you and praying for you. Amen. Hmm. Well, Lord, for each and every one of us here this morning, God, from those who are starting their journey brand new with you, the first steps, Lord, I pray, God, that they would be comforted. The first steps, I pray that they would be confident. And, Lord, that you would show yourself in a mighty way. But also for those of us who've been serving you, Lord, that are desperately believing for a mighty work in our world, for a mighty move in not just Manhattan Beach, but the South Bay and the county of Los Angeles, California, to our country. God, we, we're praying for so many different things and so many different areas, Lord, not just our own homes and not just our own jobs and finances and relationships, Lord, but we're seeing so many things happen in the world today that most of us are getting more and more fired up about how can we help, how can we reflect you, how can we bring Jesus to a world that desperately needs you, God. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, God, that you would help our unbelief. And I pray, God, that you would give us the words to say, the actions to have, and just the wisdom to carry out some acts of Christ in our days this week, Lord. I pray that you bless Every person here, Lord, in every way, shape, or form, most of all, I pray that you're blessed by all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We got